Hi everyone, welcome. This is National Master Dennis Montecrucis, and today we're going to continue our countdown through the top 20 games of the previous United States Chess League season. Um, this is our number 19 game, of course, and the players in this match are Joshua Friedel, who had white and is playing for the San Francisco team, and black, and the winner of the game was Lev Millman, playing for Carolina. Uh, the game is a Marshall Gambit, which, if you haven't seen the Marshall before, it may seem like the most incredibly exciting opening in the world. And in fact, the history of the Marshall Gambit is really very interesting. But nowadays, it's it's generally played as, as kind of a drawing weapon. And this has, in fact, been the case really since the, the 19, 1960s, I would say for sure, when Spassky used it very effectively in his candidates match against Mikhail Tal. And uh, nowadays, really, um, the Petrov is... I would say a more interesting opening than the Marshall Gambit, at least in top play. But this is really only the result of a tremendous amount of work having been done on the Gambit. So even though nowadays, again, it's it's uh, relatively, well, it's it's uh, not exactly tame, but it's it's an opening that has been so well worked out that it's very, very difficult for either side to achieve much of anything. So anyway, we'll take a look at this game. And we'll make comments at the appropriate places. By the way, I'd like to, uh, again, engage in a little plug. So as we're plugging the U.S. Chess League here, I'll also, uh, like to, I'd also like to direct people to my blog. So that's at chessmind.powerblogs.com, chessmind.powerblogs.com. And um, those of you who are watching this live, I invite you to take a look over there since I'll be doing a lot of coverage of the, uh, the Vikons A tournament, which starts later today as I record this. Okay, so enough about that. Back to the business at hand, the U.S. Chess League. Okay, so Friedel plays e4, e5. We have the Ruy Lopez. And we'll just head quickly to the Marshall Gambit, which is constituted by the move d5. So white is giving up, oh, sorry, white. Black is giving up this pawn on e5. But in return gets beautiful development and good play against the uh, the white king side. So we'll see how this goes. The best thing for white to do here is certainly to accept the gambit. So e takes d5. All right, and now we have, at least historically, a parting of the ways. So in, in the original famous Marshall Gambit game, where Marshall played it against the then world, well, no, he wasn't world champion yet. He was about to be, um, Jose Raul Capablanca. So this is in, in a tournament in 1918, and Marshall had played it once before, though it was in a little-known game, and, and from Capablanca's standpoint, this was brand new. Now, in that game, Marshall played knight to f6. And I'm not sure I have the exact move order right, but it basically went like this. d4, bishop to d6, rook e1, knight g4, h3, queen h4, queen f3. And this is really quite sharp and a lot of fun, but... Ultimately, this is in White's favor, and in fact, Capablanca won a brilliant game. He essentially refuted the variation over the board in his first in his first try. So, a really fantastic performance by him, and, and it's a game that everyone should check out. And uh, if you can take a look at the game in Capablanca's book, My Chess Career, because there he uh, writes with with a great deal of, of, of frankly, kind of a, a machismo there, where he says that um, he felt honor bound that Marshall would basically dare to play against against him, you know, it was so much Marshall's better. So it's kind of amusing, but in any case, Capablanca's play was was just absolutely spot on. Beautiful play. Okay, well, going back here, this knight f6 move is now more or less out of business, essentially because of Capablanca's play. There's, there have been some refinements, but essentially that takes care of everything. Oh, just just for your information, though I won't say anything more about it, I should point out that there's also a, an interesting little sideline here, too, that a lot of people don't know about, and it's the move e4. So this, too, isn't considered very dangerous, but it's worth knowing a little bit about. So here, here, and then d4, f takes g2, and uh, al although white's kingside looks kind of damaged, the pawn on g2, in a way, helps white. I mean, very often... Like in the Sicilian, when there's a pawn on f7 or, or on h7, so white's played, for example, g4, g5, g6, and then takes on either of those squares. Black will often just leave the pawn there, and it serves as a pretty useful shield in, in many situations. And so, too, it is here with this pawn on g2. I mean, it keeps the g-file closed irrevocably. Now, if 
black and uh, can get rid of some, or can, can start putting some other pieces around the king side. It, the pawn could be useful, but at the moment at least, it, it helps keep some lines closed. Anyway, this is interesting. White scores quite well in this variation, but as a surprise weapon, it's probably not so bad. Okay, but that's all I want to say about that variation. So we'll go here, and the move nowadays that is played pretty much universally, and in fact, I think Marshall devised this one as well, is c6. So he just shores up the knight on d5, and prepares to play bishop to d6 and queen h4 and so on. Um, kind of like what he does in the knight f6 line, but without the, uh, the waste of tempi with the knight. All right, so here the usual procedure is for white to play d4. And bishop to d6, rook e1, queen h4. Here you can't play h3 because black will simply snap the pawn off and, and kill white, if I, if I recall correctly. I mean, no one plays h3, so I didn't bother to check this, but I'm pretty much sure that it's because of this. Yeah, I don't see any really fantastic response for, for white here. So there's at least a perpetual check for black, and the threat is to play bishop h2, then the bishop goes back to g3, queen goes to h2, and queen f2 mate. And the fact that black can cut off the e-file if need be with rook a to e8 doesn't help white any either. So after queen h4, g3 is the move, black plays queen h3, and this position, white has played bishop to e3, I would say about six billion times, while rook to e4 is, is far less common. It's only been played maybe two or three billion times. So both of these are, are quite common, have been worked out pretty pretty thoroughly. Rook to e4 is maybe more interesting these days, but but still, I mean, it's um, still very, the, the drawing percentage is very, very heavy in all of these lines. So black plays g5, because white can't take here, on account of this fork. So after g5, yeah, all kinds of stuff has been played. Um, queen f1 is sometimes played. Queen goes back to h5, knight to d2, bishop to f5, and then white plays f3. So again, this looks really exciting. I mean, first black sacrifices a pawn, now white sacrifices the exchange, but uh, black isn't going to take it, because if he does, then white is going to have just a, a fantastic position, probably with both moves. I mean, I think fe looks okay, and even knight takes e4 might be all right, but, but I mean, fe is just the much more natural move, and so he's got this big pawn center, he's got the open f file, black's king side is a, is a bit uh, compromised, so black doesn't accept it. Anyway, this is all, as I said, very overplayed theory, if anything. So Friedel chose g3, and this, this can go in independent directions, and in fact does in the game, but the standard remedy to this has always been, well, after bishop to d6, rook e1, to just play queen to d7. And so the point is that after d4 and black plays queen to h3, we're back to the uh, the 6 billion and 2 billion variation. So again, rook to e4 or bishop to e3, and uh, nothing new under the sun here. But perhaps because um, you know, I just wanted to try something a little bit different, Friedel played bishop to f5. Now, this move has been played um, a fair amount the last last few years. So enough that it's known about. I mean, not enough, I would say, that it's maybe completely worked out. Okay, so the next few moves are all pretty pretty standard. So white plays d4, black plays queen to d7. And this is very typical. So black is going to have good compensation because of his control over the light squares on the king side. It's going to take white quite a while to get this bishop into play. And meanwhile, of course, black already is, is up in development. You can see, I mean, he's pretty much got everything out, whereas... White's queenside development in particular is, is really quite slow. So in the time that white has to spend neutralizing black's initiative on the king side and on the light squares, black will have gained enough space and uh, will have enough of an initiative on the king side that it's very, very difficult for white to have any realistic winning prospects. And, and that's why, again, this is just kind of a, a very drawish opening in terms of how it works in, in uh, the praxis of title players. Okay, white plays bishop to e3, so that way when the knight comes to d2, it's not blocking the bishop. And uh, also, covering the e-file is not a bad idea. Okay, black plays rook a to e8, all very standard, knight to d2, bishop to g4, queen to b1. The reason to go there rather than to c2, well, is that if black plays bishop to f5 at some point, white can consider bishop to c2. Although, as it turns out, it's not clear that that's actually so great for white. So in this position, um, the move that's been played the most, maybe 
maybe exclusively prior to this game, was bishop to f5. And now white has quite a few options. Now, one very fast game that took place um, last year in Dresden saw bishop to c2. And black won very, very quickly. So he traded bishops and now played f5. And this is, again, a very common martial gambit idea. I mean, you can see black's forces are really very nicely amassed on the king side. And so here we actually get to see the martial gambit in its dangerous glory as opposed to its drosh, non-glory, or ignominy. Okay, so c4, takes, takes, and now f4. So here he comes, just going straight ahead, bishop to d2, f3. Of course, black is now threatening to play queen to h3, and greet the, uh, the white king on g2. So white played queen to d3, the point that now of queen to h3, White simply plays queen to f1. But here, Nadich, or sorry, it was Gustafsson, so it was, Nadich was, uh, was white, and uh, John Gustafsson, or Jan Gustafsson, was black here. And he, Gustafsson played a very nice move. He played rook to e2. So a beautiful move, cutting off the, the coordination here. After rook takes e2, queen to h3, knight e3, it might look as if white has got everything covered, because now if knight takes e3, don't look at the screen, <laughs> f takes e3, and the rook simultaneously covers the g2 square. So, of course, black can take, but after queen e2, white's up a couple of pawns, and there's no, no real threat. Bishop takes g3 is, is useless. So here you might want to stop the uh, recording and see if you can figure out what it is that black ought to do in this position. So take a pause, work it out, and good luck. Okay, so this is the position again, and um, this is actually the final move of the game. So the move that was played by Gustafsson is a beautiful one. He played rook to f4. So a spectacular finish with the point that um, if g takes f4, knight takes f4 is, is simply winning. Probably bishop takes f4, that might even be winning too. And meanwhile, if, um, if white doesn't take on f4, black's threat is simply to play rook to h4 with the point of, um, well, that he's going to take on h2. If white tries to defend with knight f1, then there's queen of g2 made again. So I can illustrate this. All right, so there's that mate. And if um, white takes the rook, so let me go ahead and just enter this as a variation. So rook to h4, g takes f4, and now there's mate in two. Very simple. So a beautiful little, little uh, combination and, and game by, by Gustafsson. And it shows that maybe bishop to, to c2 is a bit dangerous. It's not, as, uh, it's not quite the panacea we might think at first. Okay, so uh, another game saw queen to c1. Actually, quite a few games saw this. And now black has tried h5. And this occurred in a game between Leko and Anand from Cap Dagda in 2003. And this game, uh, Anand won with black, but it was equal through about move 36, and then on an, or Leko just blundered in, in a complicated position, but still was equal. Um, rook to e6 was played in a game between Shabalov and Aronian in Mallorca in 2004, and this game also was won by Black. Um, another move that was played is rook to e7, and this occurred in a game between Anand and Svidler from the Mexico City World Championships last year. And uh, this game, I, I'm not sure that White obtain an advantage, clear any kind of clear advantage, right away. But but he did outplay Svidler and, and went on to win. And then finally, Bishop to d3 has also been played, and this occurred in a game between Yordashescu and Aronian once again in Mines in 2003, probably in a rapid event. And that game was drawn in 53 moves. So there's been some pretty high level games here, and uh, it's it's worth knowing about these games if you if you play either side of the marshal. All right, so as I said, all of those games started with bishop to f5. In our game, Millman produced a novelty, rook to e7. And this is very logical and, and a standard martial gambit idea, doubling on the e-file. And this, this makes perfectly good sense because this bishop on e3 is uh, it's a bit loose. Now, white can maybe try to short up with knight to f1 at some point, but if he does that, well, then the f3 square becomes available. And also, again, black might play f5 and f4 at some point, too. So black has perfectly good compensation at this point. I mean, I think white's advantage, if any, is, is minuscule. Okay. Friedel played knight to e4, and this is a bit double-edged. So it, it gives up the light squares to some extent, or at least it, it he's 
voluntarily exchanging off one of the pieces that can fight for the light squares. And in return, he, he gets the uh, the bishop here. And without the bishop on d6, maybe it's a little tougher for black to play f5 and f4. So it's a trade-off. Also, white gets a little more space. I mean, he is kind of cramped. So the exchange is favorable in that sense as well. But I'm not sure overall it's it's beneficial. Okay, Friedel, uh, sorry, Milman continued with his plan. Rook f to e8, takes and takes. And um, now black is threatening simply to capture on e3, of course, and regain the pawn. And also loosen up white's kingside a little bit. So Friedel defends it. Now, you wouldn't want to play a move like bishop takes d5. I mean, this would be really pretty close to suicidal. And, and the reason is that while the op while it's opposite colored bishops, that, in fact, is completely to black's favor because, again, white just has Swiss cheese over here on the light square. So, you know, you shouldn't think of opposite colored bishops as very drawish, unless it's just a straight opposite colored bishop ending. I mean, if there are other pieces, it's uh, much more difficult. And even, of course, not all opposite colored bishop endings with just bishops are drawn either. But, again, with all of these pieces, it's far from drawish. And, in fact, here it really makes white kind of de facto a piece down because this bishop just can't do anything. So this would be an absolutely atrocious move positionally. Two question marks. Okay, so queen to d3 was the move, perfectly natural move. All right, and now Milman played queen to f6, which enables the queen to kind of take aim at some of these light squares on, on the king's side, especially f3. Also, it prepares, in some cases, to play bishop to f5 as well. All right, well, now here I think we have a, a pretty interesting moment in the game. Now, Friedel played bishop to c2. And, um, of course, this uh, forces a, a small weakening in black's king side, though it turns out not to be really very significant. Uh, it also, though, brings the bishop a little bit closer to the king side and with gain of tempo. So the point is that after g6, Friedel played queen to d2, and this gives him the option to play bishop d3 and bishop to f1 to, to help cover up over there. So we'll come back to this, but I just want to point out another important idea here for white, and it's the move a4. And in fact, this is a very important theme or thematic uh, idea for white against the martial gambit. Black, as we, we've seen, I mean, has excellent control over the king side, and even in the center he's very well placed too, especially with the doubled rooks on the e-file. So white's only trump, really. I mean, white can only try to do two things, I would say, if he hopes to win in a martial gambit. One is to simply successfully trade everything off and win with the extra pawn. And this is, in fact, quite difficult to, to achieve, but it, it's been done. The other thing that he can do before just trying to chop everything off the board is to gain some queenside play. And a4 is really the, the, the main avenue by which that can occur. And in fact, if black's b-pawn we're still back on b7, then that would really take that that away. I mean, it would be much, much harder for white to uh, to have any kind of counterplay against black were that to be the case. So the, the pawn on b7 is, in fact, a slight... Uh, let me get rid of these arrows. ...is, in fact, a slight um, disadvantage for black. Um, and it gives... So it gives white this little hook to, to get some play over there on, on the queen side. Okay, well, after a4, white wants to follow up with moves like a takes b5, and then rook to a6, pressuring this pawn, and also, of course, making some pin opportunities come available as well. Okay, well, this takes a little time, and as we'll see, black black gets there with uh, all, all due haste. Okay, so one possibility here is bishop to h3, but this isn't so good. After bishop to d2, it looks to me as if white is actually in pretty good shape. So f3 is covered. And the bishop on h3, it's, it's kind of a, a lone ranger there. He's not going to have any help on the, uh, on the light squares. So the better way to play, maybe a little bit surprisingly at first, is bishop to f3. You might wonder, well, how is this better? I mean, for it to, to get anywhere, black has to maneuver his queen to h3. And so isn't it kind of, you know, one of these six of, six of one half dozen of the other situations? You know, what's the difference between bishop on h3 and queen on f3 versus bishop on f3, queen on h3? Well... As we'll see, it, it just does make a difference as, as the tactics work out. All right, so let's let's take a look at bishop to d2 first of all, which kind of goes in the same direction. Well, here immediately we'll see a difference, and if the black has the move bishop to e2, kicking the queen away from the king side, and in fact encouraging it to, to kind of step on the bishop's toes and also blocking the e-file. 
So after queen to c2, queen to f3, let's say takes and takes, takes and takes. Now, in fact, black is in quite good shape. And uh, among the ideas, you have h5, h4, and h3 if possible. And also, there's the idea of maybe playing bishop to d3 followed by bishop to e4. Now, that, that won't work right away because rook takes e7 and there's back rank issues. But let's say h5 is played first. And if white plays h4, well, then this bishop d3, e4 idea is very, very dangerous. So white should probably play bishop to e3, threatening the bishop and also preventing bishop to d3. But this is just perpetual. So rook takes e3, fe, queen e3, king g2, and the queen's just going to go back and forth from f3 to e3. So this is another very common kind of idea for, for black, a tactical idea. All right, so bishop to d2, in this case, doesn't work so well. Well, how about we continue with the plan with a takes b5. Now, this looks like it's it's pretty good at first, but black has a, a beautiful resource here, knight to f4. Now, that's not a move you want to see, frankly. So it threatens the queen, of course. In some cases, the knight might go to h3. And it's also immune, or, well, I'm not sure if it's entirely immune, but certainly the bishop can't capture. If the bishop takes, then rook takes e1, wins lots of material. So g takes f4 may in fact be kind of forced, and now bishop to e4. So notice, of course, black would love to play queen g6, but there's queen takes g6. So first we kick the queen away, and white has to give up his queen. So queen takes, rook takes, but now b takes a6. And this is a little bit reminiscent of the, the kramnik leko game from their World Championship match in Brasago, where um, Kramnik sacrificed his queen for this past A pawn, and it didn't work. He should have taken a draw at some point, went on to lose. Brilliant game by Leko. But here, I think it just is a draw. So queen to f5, a7, and then here, uh, rook to a8 is one way of, of drawing, but it's a little more complex. But just this repetition is quite simple. I mean, of course, king to g1, queen g4 check again, and if he tries to come out, Black sacks the exchange, and again we've got a draw by perpetual check here. So a takes b5 is not a winning try. So we'll look at one last move here for white before we get back to the game, and that's bishop to d1. So again, this is quite logical. So we're fighting to get rid of black's uh, dynamic light square duo. If we can't trade the queens, we'll trade the bishops. Okay. Well, the problem is that uh, the duo can be replaced by the h-pawn. So takes and takes, takes and takes, rook a6. So here comes white, but black is there in plenty of time. And there's a kind of a dual threat. h3 is possible, but also h takes g3, followed by a bunch of captures on e3 could also occur. So white's best here is to play queen d1. And now black has a choice. So he could either swap queens, regain his material, and we just end up in a, a drawn ending here. Kind of like the game, but a little bit better for white com by comparison. And, and there's a lot of things that are possible. It's all probably drawn, but at least this this is kind of an interesting position. Okay, so let's go back to here. Instead of trading queens, black can play queen to e4, renewing the threat of h3. And so here we should probably have a kind of a repetition like this. Okay, so that was our discussion of the move a4, trying to Blast opens some lines on the queen side. As I said, the move Friedel chose is bishop to c2. So g6. Queen f1 is possible here, but um, I think this is, again, just another drawn ending. But, but again, this, I think, this is probably the best that white could have gotten in the game, in, in, as far as I can tell. So we just trade everything off. And now white plays rook to e1. And so the point is that after this exchange, Black has all of his pawns on light squares, and that's, of course, a slight detriment because it means that they're targets. So with all of uh, white's pawns on dark squares, or almost all of them, uh, it makes them immune to the, uh, to the, the black bishop. Also, they work together. So the white, white's bishop controls light squares, white's pawns control the dark squares. So it's, it's much more harmonious there. But all the same, it seems that after bishop to e6, followed by bishop to d5, Black really just doesn't have any problems, so his whole structure is, is quite sound. His king can get to d6 very easily. So this, this is really just one more draw. It's, it's um, optically better for white because of the color of the both sides' pawns are on, but, 
but nothing more. Okay, so let's just go back to here. So after g6, white dropped the queen back to d2, as I pointed out earlier, with the idea of bringing the bishop to d3 and to f1 to help cover up over there. So in fact, Milman played bishop to h3, bishop d3, queen f3, bishop f1, takes, takes, and once more, h5. And the threat of h4, h3 really is sufficient to, to assure black of a draw. And really at any point, they probably could have just shook hands and, and been done with the game. But, but it goes on, and um, well, the game remains interesting. So it, it, there are many ways in which it could just die as a draw, but both sides kept, kept wriggling a little bit. And Milman just did a better job than, than Friedel did. Okay, now if h4, trying to stop it, that's just an outright blunder because the knight takes e3, and white loses his whole king side as far as the pawns go. So that's, that's a non-option. Non so he plays rook a to e1, protecting his bishop, and now h4. And so of course, white has to challenge the black queen before h3 happens and queen g2 made is the next move. So he could try queen to e2, and this is, I think, another repetition draw. So queen to e4, and now queen to d2. So um, threatening various uh, discoveries, and if h3, f3 is okay here. So instead, though, Friedel played queen to d1. And now black just takes everything off, regains his pawn, and we should be headed for the draw. So takes and takes, takes and takes, 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 takes. Okay, so material is equal. And although black has control of the e-file, there really shouldn't be anything he can do with it. So king to g2, and if he plays rook to e2, I mean, that's just a dead end. Rook e2 check, rook f2 uncheck, and that's the end of the penetration for for black. So really, this is this is a fairly deadish draw. Black played f5, which is it's a good move. He's um, getting some space over there, and likes to play king g7, king f6, and... If white does absolutely nothing, he'll slowly advance his kingside pawns and get, gain some more space. But but really, this is all very, very simple. Okay, now white could play rook to f2 here, and probably just sit on the position and, and draw comfortably, but nothing wrong with what he did either. So he played d5. Now, here, Milman mixes things up a little bit. So he plays, plays the move c5. And this kind of reminds me of nature documentaries. So you've got, uh, you know, you have the lion and you've got the... Uh, the gazelles, hopefully that's the right antelope. Um, someone can, of course, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you've got, you know, you have the lion, you have some kind of deer. And what always happens, well, as long as you've got the whole flock of, of, of antelope together, the lions are, are pretty well uh, pretty well stymied. So what they do is they kind of chase, chase young ones and, and weak ones and try to separate them from the rest of the herd. And when they're all alone, then they're even more vulnerable than they already are. And that's kind of what, what Milman's C5 is all about. So he's, he's separating this D5 pawn from, from the herd, in effect. So he could have just swapped it off, and that would have been just one more boring draw that, that could have transpired. But instead, he's giving white a passed pawn, and one that's safe for the moment, but it's also a pawn that could be lost down the road. And as we'll see, does in fact get lost later on. So it's, it's keeping, keeping some life in the position. Okay, Friedel pushes, rook to d8, d7, king f7, and now here white could have played rook f2, just safeguarding the second rank, and after king e7, rook f to d2, and then king f3, taking control over the second rank. So it, it, we're expelling black's little visitor there, and uh, the d-pawn is safe, and uh, I mean, even if even if um, Milman plays like rook c6 and rook c7, well, when that happens, um, white can just play rook to e1 check, kick the king away, and then bring the rook back. And, and that would just be one more simple draw. So it's a little tough. I mean, white really doesn't have much of an adventure. Again, this, this should just be a draw. But here, instead of rook f2, Friedel plays actively with rook to d6, which is fine. Milman plays rook e6. And now here, a uh, little choice. White can play rook to d2 which would make sense, uh, given that he wants to double rooks on the d-file, so, which is what he does. And then there's no rook to e2 check to worry about. So instead he plays rook to d5, and this makes him a little bit more vulnerable when he plays rook f to d1 next, but he's hitting the c5 pawn, so it's, it's trade-offs. Okay, king to e7 happens, rook f to d1, rook e2 check, 
king f3, and rook takes b2. So here the position is still a draw, but you know it's a little bit more uh, a little bit more interesting now. I mean, black is a safe pawn up at this in this position, and uh, you know so maybe white has a little bit of a burden burden of proof here. So really, I mean, I think rook to d2 a few moves ago. So after rook to e6, of course it's easy from the with the benefit of retrospect to say, of course you should have played rook to d2, kept his second rank and and the pawns there safe. But okay, he still could have drawn after rook to d5. And in this position, all right. So here, the drawing move was rookie five check. So we kick the king away from the pawn, and only then do we take on c5 or play g4. But even so, okay, rook c5, rook a2, white's still a pawn down. So we should play g4, uh, get rid of his one semi-weak pawn over there, and also make black's king side and the king in general, or in particular, I should say, more exposed. So takes and takes. And although black is a pawn up here, white should draw without too much difficulty. Okay. Also possible is the immediate g4. And here, let's say rook takes a2. We have a big capture fest. Rook c5, king e6, rook h6. So that way, if rook d7, there's rook h7 check. So rook c2. And this is complicated, so it's it's not trivial anymore for white, but he is drawing, and black always has to be a little little careful about, of course, this deep one. I mean, white is threatening something like rook to e8 here, so black maybe should play king to f7 at this point. All right. At any rate, um, the the point is that there is still some life to the position, and now both sides have to solve some problems. Unfortunately for for Friedel, instead of playing rook to e5 check, he chose rook takes c5 immediately. And the problem with this is that after rook takes d7, now black has、uh, no problems. I mean, he's simply up the pawn, and white has an inferior pawn structure, and black is just winning now. All right, so he played rook to e1. Notice, of course, that rook to e5 check doesn't do anything. Black can either play king to f6 or even king to d8. Yeah, probably king to d8 is better because king f6 maybe rook takes f5. Not 100% sure about that either, because the a2 pawn hangs. But、um, simply king to d8 should be just fine. And this also, of course, keeps white's rook off of e6 because of that. So this is this is winning for black. So in the game, Friedel played rook to e1 check, king f7, rook c6. And so now white's hope is to be able to play rook e to e6. With pretty good counterplay, so he can start bothering the king with with a check. He's threatening to take on g6, and he's threatening to grab on a6. Unfortunately for 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 him, there are some neat little tactical shots that Milman has at his at his disposal. So after rook takes a2, if Friedel tried rook e to e6, then there's rook to d3 check, and all of a sudden the white king is a bit funny. So king f4. I mean, he could play rook to e3, but then he's just Trading off and down two pawns for nothing, which is hopeless. So let's see what happens if he goes forward. King f4, rook f2. Now we take this pawn.、Uh, if the king goes to h6, rook h2 is just mate. So we've got to try going here. And now after rook f to f3, white has no good defense to the threat of rook to g4 mate. So that that's just it. I mean, he has、uh, one safe check. Rook f rook to f6 check. King goes to g7. And that's it. White's got to burn, burn a rook, and he'll still get mated pretty quickly after that. So since rook e to e6 is not going to save the day for White because of this tactical problem with his king, he's just busted. He's just down two pawns. So he tried rook to e3. Milman plays the very active rook d to d2, threatening mate in one move. So here comes the king on his little journey. Now rook to a4 check. I suppose if the king goes back to f3, probably among other things, g5 should be decisive, threatening g4 mate. And it almost looks like there should be some kind of problem mate, like、uh, rook f4 check and g4 mate. It's not mate because the king is g3, but some kind of trick like that. It would be nice if that was in the、uh, in the year too. At any rate,、um, this is an easy win for for black. Okay, so he played king to e5. And、um, all right, at least the king appears to be safe for the moment. And White is threatening to play rook c7 check, and then king f6, 
They might even get some serious counterplay. So Millman wisely plays rook to d7, and not incidentally, this comes with a threat, rook to e7 check, winning the rook on e3. So Friedel plays rook f6 check, king g7, and now rook to e6. So he's taking care of that. Um, still kind of stuck, though, because the rook can't leave, well, this rook on e6 can't leave the e-file without allowing rook to e7 check, while the other rook <laughs> can't leave the e-file because rook to e4 is mate. So this is a pretty miserable position for white. And so Milman just played a5, which is uh, it's not quite a zugzwang, but it's close enough. And uh, certainly he can make some progress. So if, if nothing happens, black can maybe play rook to c4, and then start pushing the a-pawn some more. And at some point, white's going to have to quit the e-file with one or the other rooks. All right, so he played rook to e8. King to f7. Again, the rook can't leave the e-file because of rook to e7. So he plays rook to e6. And now as advertised, uh, Millman just plays rook to c4. And in this hopeless position, white resigned. So again, black is just going to push the a-pawn, if nothing else. And um, when whichever rook leaves the e-file to take care of the problem, it's going to allow a rook to check on the e-file and win. So. A good game by Millman. I mean, he certainly didn't do anything wrong. I mean, he, he uh, took took the chances that he was offered. But the game rated a little bit um, less highly than it might have because it was it was really pretty straightforwardly headed for a draw until um, White's mistake on move 39 with rook takes c5. Though really, I mean, I think the, the whole decision to play rook to d5 a few moves earlier was itself a bit of an inaccuracy, too. So an interesting game. I mean, overall pretty well played and, and instructive, but you know, not really spectacular and, and, and decided, unfortunately, by, well, to some extent, by a, by a one mover. Though, I, again, I think the game was starting to become a little bit interesting even by that point. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and, and if you didn't know the Marshall Gambit, I mean, I think it's especially an interesting game for you. But I think even for those of us who, who are familiar with it, there are still some interesting points to it. And it's also nice to see that at least this relatively unexplored line is uh, starting to become more popular. So this, this line with black playing bishop to f5 instead of going down the old beaten path with queen.